Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unisor Education. Um, this lecture is part of the Advanced Mathematics course for teenagers presented on unisor.com and that's where I suggest you to um, listen to this lecture from because um, the lecture contains notes and notes might actually explain certain things slightly differently than what I'm talking about. Basically it's exact about the same. But anyway, there might be some details. Or maybe I'm omitting something during my um, presentation now, but I include it into the notes. So it's important that you um, read the notes. And um, actually this is uh, the problem-solving lecture, which means that I do recommend you first go to the website, go to the notes, and try to solve these problems just by yourself. Um, there is, well, there are answers. There are three problems and there are answers in the notes, so um, before you're reading the solutions or listening to this lecture, I think it's very important for you to try to solve these problems just by yourself. Okay, um, this is um, the third set of problems on conditional probabilities. Um, and let me just, you know, start one by one. Okay. The problem number one. Um, you have two dice and I'm interested in the event sum equals to seven of both dice, sum of the numbers on both dice equals to seven. Under condition that the number one dice shows the number which is greater than three. So, we are interested in the conditional probability of the sum of the two numbers and two dice uh, to be equal to seven under condition that the first dice shows a number greater than three, which is four, five, or six. Okay. It's very, very important in all these cases, um, well, in probabilities in general, but conditional probabilities especially, it's important to understand um, the, graphic, the graphics of these probabilities. So basically we are looking at the theory of probabilities from the measure theory standpoint. So I have um, an experiment with two dice each one of them from 1 to 6, so I have 36 different elementary events and as usually uh, I put them graphically into the table of 6 by 6 basically signifying this is number one and this is number two so it's one two three four five six one two three four five six and intersection of the column and and the, and the row basically means the row for instance this one is four and that's the first dice and the column let's say it's five that's the second dice so now let's um, graphically represent the events which we are interested in. First of all, we are interested in the event that sum is equal to 7. So let's just forget about condition. We are interested only in the, in the event, and we'll call it A. So the sum is equal to 7. Now, what are these? Well, the first one is 1, and the second one is 6, right? So it's this one or 2, 5, this one, or 3, 4, or 4, 3, or 5, 2, or 6, 1. So these are events, uh, elementary events, which comprise together an event that the sum is equal to 7. Okay. Now, what are the events when the first dice has greater than 3? So the first dice is the row, so it's this, this, and this. So events are this, 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 
all these which have the row greater than 3, which is 4, 5, and 6. Well, as you see, we have 1, 2, 3 on the intersection, which belongs to both. But let's forget about this for a while. Let's talk again about... I don't, I don't want really to, to apply formula. With the formula, it's really solved in one second. But I would like actually to, to go through some understanding of what conditional probability actually is. Now, initially, all these squares have the same chances uh, to occur, which means uh, there is a probability of 136 in each one of those. Right? Now, what happens if I'm saying that the condition of my experiment is that the first dice sh shows greater than 3? It actually means that the probabilities from being evenly distributed among 36 different occurrences now are concentrated only in this particular event, which means wherever, wherever, wherever I have an X. In this, in this table. So instead of everything being equally uh, distributed among these squares, 136 each, now I have all the probabilities distributed evenly among only these 18, right? 3 by 6, only 18. So now the unconditional probabilities of all squares was 36 squares by 136 each, right? So it's 1. Now, after the condition is applied, my probability is 18 are 0 plus 18 are 1 18 also 1. So I'm shifting whatever is not really happening, I know that the condition is true, right? Which means that none of these is happening. So I basically reassigned, I redistributed the probabilities from all of these events, evenly distributed, to only those events which I know are actually occurring. And these which do not occur have zero probability. So I have 18 zeros and 18 one eighteenths. So now all the probability is here. Okay, fine. Now, what's the probability of this event now? This is sum of this, 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 and this. Now, initially, if I do not have any conditions, I had six zeros here, right? Uh, and the probability of each was 136, so I had 636 uh, probability of this occurrence, right? But not anymore since my condition is applied. Now, these elementary events, these three zeros, have probability of zero. And these three zeros have probability of one, eight, one eighteenth, right? So in theory, now the probability of this event under a different distribution of probabilities is actually three eighteenths. That's how it's supposed to be like logically presented. we can actually formalize it and say something differently because if you um, actually pay attention to this what is the probability of these three events which are both x and zero in this case well the probability is a relative well uh, measure of whatever event we are interested in relatively to entire probability right so Entire probability is concentrated here. So these are number of events which are really occurring. And we know that their number is 18. And these are events which are occurring among them. And that's why it's 318. So it's a relative measure of these out of those. And if we are talking about evenly distributed uh, probabilities, it's obviously the same as, now what are these three? It's basically an intersection of this event with this event, right? So that's why 
the formula of conditional probability looks like this. So the conditional probability is the area or a measure of the intersection of A and B. A is this, B is this, which is these three things, divided by the area of the condition, which is this. So, basically that's an explanation of what conditional probability is all about. And let me just go formally uh, and, and use this formula uh, to derive this, this particular value. 318 or 1,6. The probability of B, it's probability of my condition. Now this is probability of um, everything which has all, all, all the different pairs where the first is 4 or 5 or 6 and the second was anything. These are all pairs of uh, dices which have the first greater than three. Now there are six of these, six of these, and six of these, right? Because this second dice can be anything from one to six. So it's 18. So that's why we have 18. So the probability of B is equal to 1836. We're talking about initial probability, which is basically a, a reflection of the measure. Now, the probability of this particular event, which is A, intersected with B, is. So, if it's 4 and we need the sum to be equal to 7, then it's only 4, 3. If it's 5, it's only 5, 2. And if it's 6, it's only 6, 1. So, we have only three different um, elementary events which are on intersection of both. And these are, you see, 4, 3, 5, 2, and 6, 1. So the probability of A intersected with B is equal to 3, 36. And finally, if you divide one by another, if you divide 3, 36 over 18, 36, you have three eighteens, which is one six, the same as we used to have. So I was trying to explain things graphically first, and then using the formula. So that's how you probably should think about this. I mean, obviously you can go directly to a formula, but I still would like you to uh, pay more more attention to the graphical representation because it it actually represents what conditional probability is all about. It's a relative measure of whatever good things which we are interested in, which means basically both, relative to the condition, to the me me measure of the condition, which is this one. All right. It's such a simple problem and I spend so much time um, just because I would like you to understand completely what the conditional probability is all about. So, um, if you understand it quite well, then just skip all these graphical representation and you can just go to a formula and derive the results, no big deal. Alright, number two. <coughs> Very similar. I have again two dice. Now, um, I would like to know the probability of the second dice to have greater than three value under condition that the first die dice not the same as the second. So they're different. Okay? And again, let me go first to graphical representation of this. Okay. This is my first dice, this is my second dice. Okay, I need the second dice to be greater than 3, which is 4, 5, or 6, so it's these. And doesn't matter what's the first dice. That's an event I'm interested in. 
Now, what's the condition? The first not equal to the second. Well, basically it's everything except when the first is equal to second, right? So all these outside of the main diagonal are my So, except the main diagonal, when the first is equal to the second, so everything. So that's my condition. So x is my condition, 0 is the event I'm interested in. Let's again try to think about this from the redistribution of the probabilities. So before probability was equal 1, th one over 36 to each square. Now, after I apply the condition, my probability is shifted to all the axes, which is outside of the main diagonal. And there are 36 minus 6, there are 30 axes here. So instead of being distributed among 36 squares equally, now my probability is distributed only among 30 squares. All right? Uh, yeah, 30 squares marked with x. Now, out of these 30 squares marked with x, how many of them are actually satisfying this condition? Well, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, right? So, out of them, 15 satisfy this condition. So, if my measure, which used to be distributed evenly among 36 squares, and now it's distributed evenly among 30 squares, and only 15 of them are basically satisfying my condition, then the probability must be 1, one over 2, right? 15 30s. That's, that's the idea. Well, let's try and check if it works from the formula base. Again, we have this formula for conditional probability, intersections B divided by probability of B. All right, so let's just um, have both of them, A intersection uh, and, and B. So it's uh, the second number is greater than three and they're not equal. Well, basically, that's exactly what my x and 0 uh, are. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, out of 36, right? So, conditional probability, uh, sorry, the intersection is equal to 15, 36. Now, what's the condition B? Well, that's all the x's, right? And there are 30 of them. We could count, we could count it. So, the probability of my condition is uh, 30, 36. And if I divide by one by another, which is 15, 36, by 30, 36, well, I'm getting 15, 30s, which is one half. So, this is just a pictorial representation of basically the same thing. Because all these uh, squares where x and zeros are um, in the same square, this is basically the um, intersection, right? And the B is just access everywhere. So we basically divide the number of uh, intersection, number of squares in the intersection by the number of squares which corresponds to the entire condition. Okay. Fine. Forget about dice. Let's talk about something which is um, much closer to students' life. Let's talk about exams. So, a student has a hundred questions to be studied for an exam. On exam, he will get only one question and he should answer it correctly or incorrectly. Well, let's just assume um, that um, 
if the student studies the question, then he answers correctly. If he doesn't, he doesn't. All right? So we have a hundred questions, but students doesn't have time to study all of them. So he studies only seventy. Okay. If you just don't know anything about anything else, your intuitive understanding of the probability of passing the exam is 70 over 100, which is 0 0.7, right? So that's what we probably should get. This is something like unconditional probability, well, provided that certain things are relatively randomly distributed, etc. Okay. So, let's go to a concrete problem. The concrete problem is as follows. Um, the professor decided to divide 100 questions into two groups and assign students to two different groups. So, the questions from number 1 to number 50 are at group 1, and group 2 would have questions from number 51 to number 100. So, now let's just think about it. Student has started only 70 first, uh, I, I probably didn't say, the, the 71st questions from numbers from 1 to number 70. So, let's just think about it. If he happens to be in the first group, where the first 50 questions are assigned to, to are, are chosen from basically uh, for the group, then he has perfect chances to pass an exam because he has learned all 70 first questions and only the 51, uh, only the 51st questions are going to the first group. So that's good. So if he falls into the group number one, that's great. If he falls into group number two, well, it has 50 questions, but only the first 20 of them from number 51 to number 70, he has learned. So, it's iffy. He might pass or might not, depending on what exactly happens. Okay, so that's everything about the problem. Now the question. Well, actually I have three questions. Question number one. What's the probability of passing if he falls into group number one? B. What's the probability of passing if he falls into group number two, and see what is a total probability of passing. And we will talk about total probability. We did talk about this before, and we'll talk again. Okay. So, um, all right. So, let's just think about it. First of all, um, we assume that his... Uh, uh, selection into group number one or group, uh, or, or group number two is completely random. So the probability of getting into group number one is the same as probability of getting into group number two, and which is one half. That's reasonable assumption. Okay. <coughs> so how can I calculate this one? Well, that's easy. Again, let's just use. this formula. So the probability, the conditional probability of passing if he is in the group 1 is equal to a probability of uh, uh, passing uh, considering he is already <coughs> in the group 1, so he is chosen into the group number 1 uh, and, and then we can calculate the probability of passing. And this is obviously equals to 1, right? Because in the group 1, there are only first 50 questions. He knows first 70, so it's much more than needed. So that probability is equal to 1. And this probability, we know it's equal to 1 half. Uh, sorry, 1 half. So altogether is supposed to be one. So the conditional probability of passing exam if he is chosen under condition that he is 
uh, chosen into group number one is equal to one, right? So, all questions are uh, uh, studied by him, so that's why this probability is basically equal to probability of G1, which is one, one half. Now, in this case, situation is different. Is different. In this case, well, on the bottom you also have one half. But what is the probability of passing exam and to be selected in group number two? Well, out of a hundred um, questions, fifty are selected uh, into um, into group number two, right? And out of these fifty, he knows twenty, and the other he doesn't know, right? So. Um, so that's supposed to be PG2. Okay, so what's here? Um, uh, again, if you will just divide the entire um, set of questions into these two groups, you have um, Twenty, right? Twenty out of uh, fifty, uh, he knows. So let me just think about it. Uh, that's supposed to be. Let me just draw it again. So if you have a hundred questions, right? So these are two groups. So these are 50 questions and these are 50 questions. This is group one, this is group two, right? And he knows these, all these, and part of these. So the intersection is this, right? So it's 20, and this is, uh, and this is 50. So he knows 20 out of 50, right? So it's 0 0.4. Am I right? Hold on, one second. The area is equal to... The area of G2 is equal to... Let, let's do it different. Let's do it. out of 50. That's how it's supposed to be, right? So this is better to be specified as 50, 100, out of 50, 100. And this is 20, 100 over 50, 100. That's the probabilities. So all of these these are, for the first case, all of these, there are 50 of them, so the probability of the intersection is 50 one hundredths, which is one half, and the probability of the G1 is, is exactly 50 of one hundred, and that's why we have one. Now, in the second case, we have the probability of only those which he knows, which is 20, out of 100. So it's 20 one hundredths over 50 one hundredths. All right, so we've got um, this as 1, and this is 0 0.4. Right? Okay. That's my first two questions. So if he goes into group number one, he gets the probability of one of passing, 
and he, if he goes to uh, the second group, it's probability 0 0.4, which is understandably, right? Um, so you have, you know everything, that's why if you go into the group number one, you know everything, so that's why it's probability of one. And here you know basically 20 out of 50, which is 0 0.4, which is, seems to be reasonable, right? Okay. But now I'm ask, asking about the general probability. General probability, it feels supposed to be this, right? Because he knows 70 out of 100. But how can we calculate based on whatever these calculations are? Well, let me just reiterate what the total probability is. So if you have um, a sample space, and somehow it's divided into two events, X and Y. They are mutually exclusive, and some of these two events cover the entire uh, sample space. Now, in our case, uh, G1 uh, can serve as X and G2 can serve as Y, right? There are only two groups, and he falls into one of these groups. They are mutually exclusive, and the sum of these covers basically an entire random experiment. Okay. Now, then, any event A, whatever I'm interested in, A, can be represented as A intersection with X and A intersection with Y, right? A, A intersection with X is this piece, A intersection with Y is this piece. Now, I'm using plus here instead of a union. Basically, in the set theory, I should use the union, but I think we have agreed in some other lecture that if these events are mutually exclusive, or using the set theory uh, terminology, if these two subsets are uh, not intersecting, then I'll just use the, the plus here. And the reason for this is that the measure you can consider measure as an area, for instance, of the A. It's sum of these two areas, right? And this is a real plus. So this plus is some kind of uh, invented plus. It's not a, 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 an addition, really. It's a union. I'm just using the plus. But I'm using the plus because of this. Because if I'm going into numbers with measures, then the measure of A is equal to some of these measures. And the probability is a measure, basically, because it's just a relative area of this divided by the entire uh, area of the sample space, which is, you know, assumed to be equal to 1. That's why it's basically a measure. And now, I can use this. It's equal to... Now, um, Remember from, from the formula of the conditional probability, which we have many times wrote before, the area of the measure of uh, intersection is equal to measure of the condition times measure of the event under condition of that condition, right? So that's P of X times P of A. Uh, conditional x plus p of y times uh, probability of a under condition y. And now we know all these components considering that g1 is x and g1 is and g2 is, is y. So the probability of g1 is equal to one half, right? That's the probability of falling into the first group. So it's one half times, and this probability is equal to one, plus another one half, that's probability of y, times conditional probability 0 0.4, equals 2, 0 0.5, plus 0 0.2, equals 0 0.7, and that's exactly what we expected. It's some kind of a checking, if you wish. All right? So this is, by the way, a formula of total probability, which we talked about before, and I just repeated it again. It's a very simple one, and it's related to the fact that X and Y 
are non-intersecting and covering an entire uh, sample space. That's why we can divide every event A as a union of two non-intersecting events. All right? Well, that was my last problem. Uh, thanks very much for listening to me. And uh, I certainly recommend you to go to the notes for this lecture again. And um, try to use this graphical representation, representation which I was trying to use um, a couple of times for every probability problem of that type, especially with conditional probabilities. It's very, very useful. So again, try to uh, solve these problems yourself. Um, and by the way, if you're a registered student, then you can basically enroll in an entire educational process. Um, so that's, what, that's why I recommend you to use unisor.com for, um, for uh, your studying rather than getting the lectures from YouTube or anything like that. Um, well, that's it. Thanks very much and good luck. <laughs>